Greetings, superstars, and welcome back to another episode of Word Up. This is season three. I have decided to switch up the seasons because with my podcast, as with a large majority of my life, I'm not rocking the same consensus reality temporal markers as most of the humans. And so, you know, my podcast producer, Amy in Nigeria, she's like, are you sure you want everything to be the same season? So I'm still inviting an authentic organic structure to help me delineate my seasons. And because the last episode of season two was Steven Jenkinson talking about death and because I myself have been going through a very deep death process in terms of my own personal transformation. All of this is to say, I'm deciding that this is season three right now. Um, today we have a solo podcast, which means I am interviewing myself, except I'm not really interviewing myself. I'm just rambling about the things that are on my mind and that I feel um, would be helpful to bring into the larger collective discourse by way of you picking up these ideas, talking about them, passing them around, sharing this episode and all my episodes with your nearest and dearest and getting traction as a means of shifting the earthship and humanity's trajectory. All right, so. currently Independence Day. It will no longer be Independence Day when this Word Up episode drops. And I still have a reflection that I'd like to share that I think is relevant and valuable regardless of the day, holy or not. Um, I went onto Instagram today and I saw a woman with a very large following posting something about like what a shitty country this is run by like old dead capitalist you know racist blah 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 and how this country super sucks and i wrote in the comment stream like aren't we so blessed to live in a country where you and i as free thinking women have the freedom to express these thoughts and i was dogpiled on shocker um because you know we have our own bubbles and in her bubble, everyone's like, yes, preach. It was interesting because one of the people who I saw like putting up the preach sister emoji was Cree Summer. And, um, you know, I've been a fan of Cree Summer since Different World. And she, she you know, I, I've, I've met her. I hung out with her back when she was dating my friend Jeff. And we all went to Burning Man and, you know, we used to play together and she's such a cool chick. But I was thinking like, damn, you are a black woman who has carved out such an amazing career for yourself, like as an artist, um, as a, you know, she does voiceover artists, she acts on screen, she has a musical career, it's like kind of an artist dream career. Um, and I'm like, is this like, where are you not free and rocking your empowerment and your freedom as a woman in America? Like, if there are pieces of this that I'm missing, but this is what I want to bring in. So I think so much of this comes, you know, this perspective, this lens of perception, granted it's propaganda, it's mind control, like it's been indoctrinated. We, we can see that in the media and in academia, but um, like, I feel like people who cling to this notion that America is such like a racist, shitty hellhole have never traveled anywhere else. And here are the two examples that are coming to mind. And I have shared one of these before a couple Independence Days back, so forgive me if you've already heard this, but you know, I have done a lot of travel in my lifetime. And when I was in my 20s, I backpacked my, through India for about four months by myself, which was freaking amazing. And this was in 1999, 2000. India was very different then than it is now. And I stayed at this beautiful monastery in the jungle in the BR Hills. Um, which was Swami Nirmalananda's monastery. And there was a woman who was living on the property who was about my age, I was like 27, she might've been a couple years younger. And she was living there because she was a scholar. And she was living there because she did not want to get married. And because she did not want to get married and India was, you know, 
has a very strong caste system. Her family sent her away. She was totally outcast. And the Swami, Nirmala Nanda had passed, but the Swami who had taken over had welcomed her in because she didn't have another choice as a place to live as a single woman who wasn't interested in stepping into some sort of arranged marriage. She wanted to learn and to work. So that was instance number one of, of like this really strong wake up call of like, wow, we are so blessed in America. So a few years later, I was road tripping through Morocco with my then boyfriend and some friends of ours from Denmark. It was such a fun trip. We we met in Morocco and played. And so we did a road trip. Um, and while we were road tripping, anytime the men had to go to the bathroom, they would just jump out of the car and pee, which is how I roll here in the States. But in Morocco, if I, as a woman, were caught peeing on the side of the road, I could be shot and killed legally shot and killed take this in this was in the 21st century right we're not talking like 18th century you know we're not talking about the 20s like this is not that long ago and the rule might even still be in place um it was a very frustrating road trip because i have a small bladder and we always had to find like a legit bathroom like it totally slowed us down because if i were caught peeing on the side of the road I would have been shot and killed. So I say this, it's not like I don't see issues happening in our country. And I especially see issues with this co-opting of our constitutional republic that has come through in, coming through some very nefarious players, some very nefarious clubs, organizations, think tanks. This is a very, you know, this, this plan has been going on for a long time. <clears throat> in my estimation, uh, if we undid the Patriot Act, we would get a lot closer to that constitutional republic, but it's because we are still enslaved and, and being choked by this unconstitutional Patriot Act, we have lost quite a few freedoms. I'm obviously not happy with the stronghold big tech has on freedom of speech, which let's also be clear, they are being used by those in government. It's not just free market. But all this is to say, I personally, as a loudmouth single woman, um, am very grateful for the freedom that this country has provided me, is providing me, um, despite the chinks that it has, you know, incurred throughout the past few years. And, uh, you know, that I am, I am as expressed and outspoken as I am. And even though I've been kicked out of various, you know, established, established and establishment media um, outlets, I still have the opportunity to speak my truth here. And for that, I am grateful. And that is a freedom that I do not take lightly. It has allowed me to become the woman that I am today, very independent, very autonomous, very outspoken. And I don't know that I would have had the same luxury had I not grown up in the West and specifically in the United States of America. So I just wanna get that out there. And as long as we're talking about being an outspoken woman, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine last week and I was talking about, you know, I anyone who's tracking me knows like I'm undergoing like quite a big transformation right now. Um, you know, I do have had Pluto sitting on my son. I have been in a very dark, intense dance with shadows. And um, so he was asking me like where I'm at with it now. And what I was saying was like, I feel like I'm being tasked with being smaller. And whereas, you know, I've been so big my whole life with such a big mouth and blessed with big audiences, you know, starting back when I got to write for the LA Weekly for nine years and, you know, had millions and millions of people reading my words, you know, even though the audience has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller because of, you know, clamping down on free speech and whatnot, I still, you know, have been living a big public life. And I'm feeling like a lot of what I'm being tasked with right now is being smaller, a lot more humility. Um, and ultimately, I'd like to, you know, be on camera much less and be writing a lot more. And my friend was stumped. And he was like, that's so weird as a woman, like, you know, most women are wanting to learn how to use their voice and how to be bigger. I've never heard of a woman wanting to make themselves smaller. And this man is my age. And I'm like, am I like, did we slip into a different timeline? Is this like a Mandela effect thing? Or am I on a different dimension? Like, did second wave feminism not happen? And I heard this, you know, the reason I'm bringing this up today is because this morning I was listening to an interview with Robert Ward Grant 
um, and this woman blue, she, I, I don't think this was a new podcast. It's just, she's only come onto my radar recently. And I think she's amazing. So I'm catching myself up to speed. Same with Robert Ward Grant. And so he had said that, that like, he's really interested in women starting to use their voices and empower themselves and knowing themselves as more empowered. And I'm like, are we not living in the same world? Like what I, um, like for me personally, I was the daughter of a really outspoken, independent, second wave feminist. Um, I, I grew up with like, I mean, I've talked about this. A woman needs a man, like a fish needs a bicycle. I, I'm not a fan of that um, that notion. And keep in mind, you know, Gloria Steinem was a paid CIA asset. So did she even come up with that phrase? I don't know. But I'm just thinking of like Madonna and Blonde Ambition and like, Oprah and you know the old Donna Karen ads with like a woman being sworn into the Oval Office and granted like I get that it's a process and sure we have more ways to go, but at this time like in 2023 to be surprised that there's an outspoken woman. who's wanting to learn to like pull it back a little bit, I was just like are we. Maybe we are living in different dimensions, different reality construct. I'm also coming to realize more and more a lot of the quote unquote issues that we see plaguing, you know, different like ideological camps or identitarian camps are regional, right? So I see this like when I hear Mo Fax talk about, you know, the racism that he experiences. And I heard him on one show talk about like an affluent area. And he's like, well, you know, there ain't no black people there. And I'm like, you do? what like where again i was like what timeline are you living in because when i grew up like we have like baldwin hills is where the bougie rich black people live there's tons of affluent black people where i grew up in los angeles um so much so that there's like different pockets and neighborhoods where we know the affluent black people live so i'm also realizing that a lot of these issues you know that people like to make these blanket generalizations about as though they're affecting the entire populace or the entire country the whole country's racist the whole country's sexist might simply be regional and they might simply be issues that show up in our local experience but that the rest of us aren't actually experiencing because we live in different regions so that might be the case with this woman thing but like and i mean just thinking of like sandra bernhard patty smith um, I'm thinking of like the bold voices who have influenced me. Um, and I'm like, I don't, I don't understand why in 2023, it's shocking to think that a woman, uh, is super empowered and it feels free to say whatever she wants and might now be inspired to roll it back. So uh, I'm curious to know from you, the audience, is this a timeline shift? Is this, am I crazy? Are, are we, are you and I living in the same reality construct, the same timeline, the same dimension? Um, what is your take on this? I recorded a different podcast yesterday and I'm kind of on the fence about like re-recording what I said yesterday so that like all of this matches or just splicing the two together because I've already done it and who really cares? Like I'm guessing you guys aren't tuning into me for like the seamlessness of like the wardrobe or the various, you know, or hairdos but more so for the ideas coming out of my mouth hole. So I think what I'm gonna do is just merge the two together. Let me pause and ponder this. Okay, so I have um, reviewed my notes and I feel confident in just merging the two together and making it kind of a podcast mashup and trusting that you, my audience, will understand. We have an, a, a, a small umbrella topic today, which is called things that I am shocked to know that people don't know. So first on the list of things that I'm shocked to know that people don't know is that podcasts are not journalism. So this popped up when Jordan Peterson was interviewing RFK. Rogan's podcast is number one in 97 countries. He's clearly the most powerful journalist who's ever lived. And my jaw dropped wide open. So I took this clip and I shared it in my Telegram group and I was shocked to hear people in my Telegram group who follow me on the regular concur, but he is the greatest journalist that ever lived. But but podcasts are journalism and i was like whoa let me take a step back 
and just let it sink in how confusing how confusing the landscape has gotten that even people who I consider to be up to speed on the ops and whatnot are still conflating podcasting with journalism. So I saw this start to happen when blogs became a big deal back whenever blogs became the big deal. And because before then, to be a journalist, like not only did one hopefully know the ins and outs of journalistic ethics, um, understand that journalists present multiple sides of the story, um, all that got thrown out the window with blogs because now all of a sudden it was like anyone with an internet connection and you know a blog account could post their thoughts. So I started to see where that became conflated with journalism, whereas back in the day it was like you had to prove yourself, not only with knowing the ins and outs of journalism, having good ideas, having a point of view, um, having a skillful ability to weave words together and then hustle to get yourself um, a platform, like be it a, a newspaper, a magazine, a television station, a radio show, what have you. Like those were pretty much back in the day, the only options to get your point of view heard. With, um, with blogs, now all of a sudden it was anyone who could, you know, string words together or even not and put it out on a blog. But the landscape has become even muddier with podcasts, with web series. And, and I realize that people think that just because people are sharing valuable information or valuable ideas that they're conflating that with journalism. They are not. They are not one in the same. Journalism requires that um, we present our ideas objectively. Now, granted, gonzo journalism changed that a little bit with Joan Didion, with Hunter S. Thompson, with, you know, that kind of crew that allowed us to insert ourselves into our stories and make them a little bit more fantastical and narrative-esque. But there's still a difference between journalism and cultural criticism or sharing our opinions. I share my opinions here. Please do not conflate anything that I'm doing here with journalism because I sometimes I speak sloppily. Sometimes I speak quickly. Sometimes I'm more emotional, right? This is not journalism. What I'm doing here is not journalism. When I'm writing for a paper, for a magazine, for a radio show, for a documentary, oftentimes that is journalism. But um, just because someone has smart ideas, just because someone turns us on to truths that we weren't aware of before still doesn't make them a journalist. We're not clear that they're not editorializing, that they're not inserting their opinion into things. Journalists serve a very important function, at least they used to in our culture, which is giving us all the sides of the story and then allowing us to draw our own conclusions, to make our own meaning, to cultivate our own companion, uh, our own opinions based on objectively reported facts. Now, obviously, it's been a long time since we've had that kind of journalism. I think remnants of it still exist. But to conflate Joe Rogan as a journalist, let alone the greatest journalist Western civilization has ever seen, is completely freaking absurd. Joe Rogan is not a journalist. He is a podcaster. They are not one and the same. Um, journalists hopefully and and i do i look forward to seeing this return to the landscape are holding themselves to a higher standard of objectivity and of fleshing out all sides of the story not serving ops not serving puppet masters right none of that is journalism that's propaganda i would say it's far more accurate to call joe rogan the greatest propagandist um western civilization has ever seen um rather than calling him a journalist. He's not a journalist at all. He is a paid actor who is now playing the role of a podcaster, who is now doling out some truth with a lot of propaganda. There's no journalism happening in there unless he has Matt Taibbi or you know other journalists on his show. So let's be super, super clear. Podcasting is not journalism. What Emily and I do is not journalism. Sometimes we'll bleed into investigating and sharing things, but we're still presenting our facts with our opinions and our slant and our point of point of view which takes it out of the realm of objective journalism so just wanted that to be super clear so next is i have become increasingly annoyed with 
all of the social social engineering going on in the landscape. But the, the one piece of social engineering that I want to call our attention to today is when we go to eat at a restaurant and whereas before the waiter would drop the check, thank you so much, and leave and thus give us um, privacy to figure out how we're going to pay, divvy it up, tip, et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm noticing what they do is they come over with this big clunky machine and then kind of hand it to me or, you know, whoever I'm eating with and expect us to pay them there. So here it's, it's gross to me on multiple, uh, multiple different levels. One is it's a complete status flip, right? We, we've gone from the person in the service position, and I say this from as someone who waited tables for 12 years in Hollywood and Beverly Hills, which is like <laughs> blood money for anyone who's waited tables, like the worst place in the world to wait tables is Beverly Hills, the highest maintenance, lowest tipping, worst customers ever. But so, you know, the usual sort of status structure when we go to a restaurant is someone is serving us and then we are tipping them right so and you know that i'm not really super into hierarchy but for those watching this with your eyes it gives us another one of these right and for those listening with your ears i'm making um I'm, my hands are being placed on different levels which is danny speak for the hierarchical podium that i use as like a visual aid in describing status differentials so what it does is it completely flips the status where you have now someone looming over you, right? So they're literally higher than you literally have to look up to see them as we do the whole time that we're sitting at a table, but it's just different now because now they're standing over you with this machine kind of looking over your shoulder or pretending not to, or maybe even not to while you pay and tip them and they stand there. So there's no spaciousness, there's no privacy, and there's this like subtle positional bullying going on because they are standing there over me that feels like pressure, right? It doesn't feel good to my nervous system. So having hit the wall on this, um, I was having lunch with a girlfriend and they came over with that machine and I said, you know what, I'm gonna pay cash. So I'd really prefer to do it differently. They're like, okay, you can just give me cash. And I said, no, I would prefer that you print out a check and leave it here so I can figure this out in private. And I was shocked that they said, okay, and they did. And so then I was able to just put my cash on the table. They come pick it up. I get changed like the way it used to be super human. No, I don't have that pressure and this machine in my face that's, you know, ir irradiating the whole perimeter with EMFs and God knows what other information it's tracking. Like I'm so not down with it. So my new strategy when I go to restaurants is when they come with that big clunky machine, I say, no, I prefer a printed out check and some privacy, please, while I settle this up. And I'm very nice about it. And everyone has been very nice to me. And it's my way of saying, no, I'm not okay with this. And if I wasn't the only one doing it, it would certainly be possible for us to shift this. So I'm encouraging you and me and all of us and anyone who has an authentic contraction around this new way of getting us to pay, if that's not jiving with you, then I encourage you to do what I'm doing, which is to say, you know what, I prefer a printed out check and some privacy, please. Thank you so much. And of course, being polite. I mean, I waited tables long enough to know you know, treat your waiters with respect. It's a hard ass job, but this is all a way, like these things, they seem minor, you know, just signing things um, on a machine instead of paper and pen. But these are the things that are slowly getting us used to attempting to get us used to a transhumanist AI dominant future. And so as much as we can say, no, I'd prefer the analog way, the more chance we have of staving this off. You know, I keep hearing the talking heads and the people who are positioning themselves at the front of the room saying, we have no choice, this has already happened. That's bullshit. <laughs> there are more of us than them. We absolutely have a choice. It comes down to everything, you know, we've been talking about, you know, going back to face muzzles and whatnot. Just say no. The more of us who say no, that is feedback. And then they know, oh, our customers don't like this. So let's return to a means of doing business and collecting payment that pleases the customers who keep us in business. Food for thought.
So another thing that I am noticing is that I have been dealing with a physiological detox reaction purification around my mouth that has been really painful, but mostly unsightly. And here is something that I've noticed. I know exactly what's going on. I'm totally on top of my healing protocol. It's taking the time it takes, but it seems to make people in my life very uncomfortable. And what I've noticed, and specifically among my girlfriends, but really, I mean, there are some men who we can throw in there, is everyone around me, their urge to A, pathologize what's going on with my mouth, and B, their urge to tell me what I need to do to fix it. And I love that my friends love me so much that they want to go out of their way to figure out what's going on with me to give me kind and loving recommendations because they don't want me suffering, right? Like it's all coming from the best possible place. And to be clear, it's something that I do too. Like I'm wired this way. Um, I'm, I'm a child of second wave feminist mother, you know, so I am also still in the process of transmuting some overly masculine tendencies, like wanting to fix everything in my sphere. But it was interesting with my girlfriends who didn't want to, you know, it was making them uncomfortable or making them empathetic, like whatever it was, how A, they would attempt to diagnose it. Oh, it looks like a this, it's a this, it's a this, it's a this. And like, I get that not everyone has watched my language of healing webinar, has not attended my language of healing talks, but I, the number one precept of the languages of healing is do not pathologize. So I myself am not open to receiving projected pathologies from other people, especially when they're uninvited. Pathologies are laden with coding that programs the physiological body, the psychological body, the emotional body, the energetic body, and the quantum field at large. So, you know, were I to have embraced any of the pathologies that people in my life tried to project onto me, it is far more likely that my symptoms would have started to mirror those of these various pathologies and diagnoses, because that's what that type of coding does. It takes otherwise passing temporary systems. That word was supposed to be symptoms and it attempts to herd them onto a very specific pathway called pathology X or diagnosis Y. On top of that, had I embraced any of these pathologies, many of which were scary, it probably would have messed with my psycho-emotional um, calm and well-being and added another layer on top of my healing process called freaking out, which really doesn't optimize the immune system. So, for me personally, I prefer, like, I'm not open to pathologies and I know that they're coming from the right place, but even when I'm seeing a medical professional, I let them know any urge you have to pathologize, feel free to write it down for your own notes. I don't want to hear it. All I want to hear about is what is our best course of treatment for, for the symptoms that I am expressing now. Um, and what is the best course of treatment for how you think the symptoms, you know, what the symptoms may or may not be pointing to. I like to keep the conversation in the realm of temporary symptoms and not go into pathologizing or diagnosing, which is then tethered to so many worst case scenarios. Because let's be clear, every pathology and every diagnosis is absolutely inextricably bound to the worst case scenario and to the worst possible statistics because that industry, the Western medical paradigm, needs to tether their diagnoses and their pathologies to worst possible case scenario and worst case scenario statistics to cover their own ass, because their primary concern is not getting sued. Secondary is helping their patients, but primary is not getting sued. And that means giving people the worst case scenario to lower their expectations. So I'm not interested in being, you know, projected upon by that system or being programmed by that system, which is why I am not available to receive pathologies to play in that paradigm at all. It was also interesting just to note of all my girlfriends, how they all wanted to fix it and tell me, take this, do this, do this, do this, do this. And again, I'm wired the same way. I'm still unraveling those tendencies to go to the masculine fixing doing instead of just being with. But I will say, like, I didn't ask anyone for their opinion as to what they thought I needed to do. They offered these things of their own accord. And I think it just speaks to 
the rebalancing that we're all being invited to do in terms of being able to toggle between the masculine and the feminine, it was, was really most helpful for me was just people who are willing to be with me and not need to comment and not need to fix and not need to like freak out around what was expressing and purifying through my mouth, but just be with me, just be my friend. Um, so that was just kind of a noticing of the larger landscape and, um, you know, makes me excited for the fact that my Language of Betterarchy book is on its way out. We're in the formatting process now because that gives us tools that's going to really help us um, attune more easily to masculine, feminine energetics, the language around them, and to be more mindful in which polarities we're choosing to communicate from and to moment to moment to moment.